Taiwan and good evening uh, my friends in the, in the United States. Uh, so uh, let me just briefly introduce to you uh, this data analytic colloquium. Um, this, well, this webinar, yeah, it's supported by uh, National Chongqing University in Taiwan and as well as the University of Texas at Dallas School of Economics, Political and po Policy Sciences. Uh, this initiative is that we uh, we started this initiative like three years ago, so this is the third years, and or you can call it the third seasons. And uh, I'm glad to see it uh, keep going. Uh, maybe the next season. But today is more like the season finale. Uh, you could you could call it that way. And this colloquium, uh, we we convene, we try to convince or invite international scholars and the data scientists in uh, using this online seminar or this platform. And as a as a seminar or a workshop uh, that we can that we can offer, and members of the colloquium will engage in conversations. And anyone that you uh, participate in this this colloquium, that we uh, your questions and and all the ideas that you are welcome. Uh, just um, touch it out, and then I believe that our speakers are very willing to exchange with all of you. And so uh, this is pretty much this. Uh, if you're interested in the past past um, seminars or webinars, uh, please just check online and go to the data analytics uh, DAC colloquium uh, dot com. And so you can see all the past uh, webinars online. So please do check and welcome. Uh, we welcome all the uh, suggestions or any advice from you. So I'll pass this um, microphone to Dr. Carl Holt. And he's going to introduce today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Chu Chen, uh, Chen Chu. Hi, Carl. Hi, thank you, Dr. Pen. And uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Carl Ho at the University of Texas at Dallas. And I'm really, really pleased that uh, we have a, a very special guest speaker uh, from Cornell University, and Dr. Chen Chu. And uh, he will be. Um, Talking on a topic, a really interesting topic about is, is titled Balancing Methods for Observational Studies. Uh, Dr. Chu is an um, uh, economic professor, uh, economic professor at um, uh, 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 Cornell University. He called himself an econometrician, and which is more like a quantitative economics, and uh, actually it's more in depth doing quantitative studies. And um, his research interests are in uh, causal inference. Uh, treatment choice and uh, statistical decision theory. Uh, Dr. Chu uh, received his PhD from London School of Economics and was a po postdoctoral fellow at the University College London and Institute of Fis Fiscal Studies prior to joining Cornell. And um, we are really, really uh, uh, honored to have Dr. Chu to give this talk tonight. Without further ado, allow me to um, Give the, uh, the mic and uh, allow uh, uh, Dr. Chu to do the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Thank you. Thank you so much. First, I just want to thank the organizers. I want to thank um, Dr. Ho and Dr. Pan for really um, having me here. I'm, I'm really excited to be here and talk with you about um, this line of research agenda that I have actually been doing um, since um, I was a, you know, a graduate student. So I've been doing this um, for a bit of a time and I believe in this method. So basically what this type of research, you know, this research is doing is basically we want to have a more robust estimation of some sort of causal effect or treatment effect when we have observational data. So it's really great that I'm presenting here today. So hopefully at the end of today's presentation, so um, hopefully I could convince you that, you know, this is a really first, you know, very simple and effective method to use for um, observational studies and it is applicable to a wide uh, you know to a wide array of data sets so hopefully yeah you could actually you know when you are doing your research you could come and use use this um, this method so um, what I'm going to do today first is I'm going to use a very um, simple empirical example in applied political economy, just to illustrate to you that, you know, that the usefulness of this new method compared to other existing methods, why this would be a better estimator. 
And then after that, um, I'm going to talk about exactly how this estimator is constructed and why it works better than the others, why it is more robust estimator uh, compared to other estimators. So, um, so what I'm, you know, talk, you know, talking today is based on two papers, mostly based on two papers. Um, it was uh, the, this, um, two papers that I have, and um, and then I have because the balancing method is um, relatively new new addition to the whole toolkit of causal inference. So I will also basically give give you a little bit of a review of the existing methods. Um, so well, so well, first of all, so let me talk about the motivation for you know this uh, this new estimator and. You know, I'm going to use um, the, the, uh, a, main, uh, a new empirical, a main empirical example to illustrate to you. So the motivation is that you know, in many empirical analysis in social science studies, you know, we need to use many control variables, right? So it is observational data. We need to estimate some treat, you know, estimate some treatment effect, and usually it involved many controls. For example, in labor economics, it is very, you know, well known. Right, because this paper is written by Heckman, and they they told they tell us if we really want to get a good evaluation of those job training programs, the effect of job training programs on the workers' wages, we need to control a full set of characteristics of the in you know, characteristics of those workers. Right, we need to control the individual characteristics of the workers. Well, in development economics, as they at all, they are studying this kind of long-term impact of some cash transfer to some poor families in the United States. And in, in order to get a good estimate, they also need to put a lot of control variables to take into account the different characteristics of the, you know, different backgrounds of the, of this, you know, observation of quite different families. Well, in finance, also Bertrand et al. They was trying to study the the trying to study the gender gap between male and female in the in the earnings for professionals working in finance. So, in order to really capture the gender gap more precisely, they need to take into account the white heterogeneity among those workers. So, usually, so they also need to put in a lot of the control variables to to capture the rich heterogeneity in the data, right? So, I think it's it's not controversial to say that you know as long as you involve you know you use some observational data usually you need to use many controls and these days usually you will have you know you because you you get some new administrative administrative data sets they are very new and usually has a lot of controls however the trick the, the tricky thing is well although we you know as researchers we know we need to put you know, rich controls there, but the economic theory usually is rarely informative enough to tell us exactly what kind of controls or which controls we should put in our specification or in our regression, right? So we know we should use many controls, but exactly what controls or technical terms. So here, technical by technical terms, I mean, you know, the interactions or squares of the control variables. So we don't know exactly what you know what kind of controls or technical terms should exactly be used. So, in you know in economics and other social science disciplines, I think a very common practice is that we can estimate, try to estimate the parameter of interest. Just use we don't know what exactly controls we should use. We just use different subset of controls, right? So we just try to add different subsets of controls and. And look at how the estimated effect changes. And what we are hoping is is that okay, I put in different set of control variables, and I would we would hope that the estimated effect are stable, right? Does not change too much. Yes, oh, Carl, so you, I see you. Can I interject? Yeah. Yeah. Do you, uh, I hope I did not miss something. And um, so, for example, and in social sciences, uh, a lot of models we use uh, demographics. Uh, maybe uh, partisan IDs and uh, like a support for certain parties uh, um, as control. 
So is yeah. this what uh, uh, you refer to? Uh, maybe we can call this like most general, like uh, demographics, gender, uh, yeah, age. Yeah, exactly. So these uh, are all yeah, control yeah. variables, right? So the demographic yeah. information, mm -hmm. the characteristics yeah. of the individuals, mm -hmm. yeah. these are all controls. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem okay. is, yeah. you know, we have these kind of rich controls of variables. Right? Yeah. We have a rich set of control variables, but exactly yeah. when you write down your regression model, you don't know exactly yeah. what kind of controls you put in there, right? What kind of demographic True. information yeah. you should put in there. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's yeah. exactly yes. the motivation. Right. So people yeah. usually do these things by using different subsets of this controls or different subsets of the demographic information or these things. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And they hope mm -hmm. by using mm -hmm. different uh, control variables, the estimated effect are, are, are stable which means they do not change yeah. too much. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. that makes sense because, you know, um, because if we get a very stable estimated treatment effect, even you use different controls, then we kind of getting really reassured because, oh, that yeah. probably mm -hmm. implies there's not much bias in my data set. So I'm kind of confident in my estimated treatment effect, right? So I think yeah. that makes mm -hmm. sense. But now what I'm going to illustrate to you is that, well, if you do have many controls and you do use this kind of approach, you might get into trouble if you use a not very good estimator such as OLS, right? So yeah, yeah, if you yeah. use a default mm -hmm. estimator, mm -hmm. you might get actually get into some trouble, right? So this is, mm -hmm. um, so this is what I'm trying, so I'm going to use this empirical example to illustrate to you what kind of trouble we're, we're going to end up with if, mm -hmm. you know, you have many mm -hmm. controls, you try with different concept sets and you just use OLS, right? So I'm going to illustrate to mm -hmm. you this example. So this is a quite a famous paper in, in economics. So it's about this, so it's in applied political economy. So it, it, what it tries to study is try to study the relationship between electoral accountability and the corruption. So this paper, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, basically what they find, they use a very special, you know, they use a very nice observational data set from Brazil. So what they find mm -hmm. is that mayors serving the first term are less corrupt than mayors serving the second term. So the stories that we're trying to tell is, you know, those second term mayors, because, because in Brazil, the mayors can only, can only serve at the most two terms. So if you're serving the second term, you don't have any incentive to behave well. So you're going to, you're going to corrupt more. Well, if you are serving the first term, you have an incentive to get reelected. So you want to behave more, you know, behave better, and then you are going to crop less. So that's the story that they're trying to tell. And what they, you know, what they actually did is they actually exploit a natural experiment where the treatment is arguably randomly assigned. So one of the, because, you know, it's kind of a randomly assigned natural experiment. So, you know, they kind of expect there's not much bias in the data set. So they, one of the main specification is just to use OLS with many controls. So there's empirical mm -hmm. strategies. It's just, you know, it's very simple. So just to give you a very basic timeline of what they did. So this figure is just directly coming from Firas and Fanon, um, 2011 AER. So basically, you know, so this, these are the election cycles. Six, uh, 1996, 2000, 2004. So this is when the year, the, these are the years where elections ha happen. So probably in, in 1996, they changed the constitutional amendment so that incumbent mayors, they can get reelected. Uh, re re so, so, so after this, each mayor can serve at most two terms. So now there's an election happening in 2000. Some of them get reelected you know, so they, they, they choose their mayors, some of them getting reelected. So that means they're serving the second term. Some of them are serving the first term, which means that's, you know, newly elected. So now in 2003, they're trying this, you know, they kind of suddenly started this, you know, anti-corruption campaign. So they are just going to randomly select some mayors and audit their finance. And then, then look at how much um, financial resources are corrupted by these by these mayors, right? So this is basically the timeline of their, you know, anti-corruption um, 
campaign and how you know th this kind of um, data set evolves, right? So because th they think it's kind of a natural experiment, so their main empirical framework is extremely simple. It's just an OLS, okay? So you can see the, the outcome, why? It's just the share of resources related to cropped activities. They collect it from the other reports and the treatment is whether they, the mayor is serving their first term or second term. So if the mayor is serving the first term, so that means D equals to one, that means their term limit is not binding. So they have re-election incentives because I'm serving my first term, I can still get re-elected, I have my re-election incentive. So that means I'm being treated. So D equals to zero. So that means it's a second term mayor because they reached the term limit, they cannot get reelected, so they don't have any reelection incentives. So essentially what they want mm -hmm. to do is to compare, you know, how well, the amount of corruption, you know, you know, conducted by those first term mayor and by the second term mayor, right? So, and obviously because it's observational data, they're going to put a set, uh, they, what they did is actually they sequentially add different set of controls involving municipal characteristics and mayor characteristics, right? So this is basically, you know, their empirical setup, which is just OLS, which is very straightforward. So now if you look at their estimate, so this is what happens. They just use OLS. So now they estimate the treatment effect, right? So, so in their data set, in, in their raw data, the estimated treatment effect is in percentage, but now I transfer it, translate it to the actual amount. So what they find is, okay, if I do not use any controls, right, I just purely look at the comparison of the outcome between a first term mayor and a second term mayor. And what they find is that actually the second term mayor, the lame duck mayor, that steals this much more money compared to the first term mayor. So this is the, right, so the, basically this says, okay, the second term mayor st on, on average every year steals this, much more, steals this much more money compared to the first term mayor. So this is the, you know, the treatment effect they estimated for, you know, being the second term. However, and then they kind of gradually, right, because, you know, they're worried about, because this observated, uh, observational data set, they're kind of worried about, um, you know, uh, a selection bias. So they kind of gradually add those, you know, control variables, including mayor characteristics, municipal characteristics, political institutions, and this lottery dummy, and this is a state dummy. So state dummy variable. So once they gradually add these control variables, and this is what happens. You can see once they add those control variables, the estimated treatment effect increases one by one. And you can see, right, it kind of always has this upward trend. And if they add all control variables, which is, so they have, in total, they have like 67 control variables, right? Once the, all the control variables, variables are added, you can see actually the estimated treatment effect actually jumped this much. So actually jumps almost to 50%, right? So, so Right, so you can see this is their estimated treatment effect. And you can see it's not stable and it's kind of having this upward trend, right? So, well, if you think up, if you pause a bit and think about it, what is happening here, well, what happens in this data set? Why do you observe this kind of upward trend when you gradually add more and more controls, right? Does this make sense, right? So now we need to think about this. Well, first, it's an, they, they argue it's, a natural experiment. So the treatment is arguably randomly assigned. So that means the treatment should be, the treatment is whether they're being the first term mayor or second term mayor should be, is arguably random. So they should not expect too much bias in the data. However, the point estimate do change a lot. So the point estimates are not stable at all, right? So you can see the estimated treatment effect increases almost to 50%. Right, you can see it's estimated treatment almost jumps 50%. And actually the standard error also increases almost 20%. So this is the problem, right? So because, you know, it is a natural experiment, we did not expect to have this kind of trend, but indeed, if you, this kind of unstableness, but indeed this happens. So how do you justify it, 
right? So if you look at, so how, I think once, you know, when you estimate some treatment fat and you've observed that kind of trend, upward trend, the common interpretation is, oh, okay, well, it's simple because that just means there's some bias in my data, right? Once I add these controls, OLS correctly, you know, controls omitted variable bias. So that means if I ignore these control variables, I'm go what happens is that I'm going to underestimate the treatment effect, the effect of re-election, the effect of uh, insensitive on corruption. So once I add more and more controls, I kind of, con you know, add more controls, I kind of partially correct the admitted ver variable bias. Therefore, I can provide you with a more precise estimate of the true treatment effect. Right. So basically, that's the story. I think what people would usually tell when they, you know, see this, this kind of upward trend. Basically, okay, if you don't add control variables, there's omitted variable bias. If I add those control variables, well, omitted variable bias is corrected. So this is the more precise estimate of the treatment. So that's how people usually argue. But what I'm going to argue is that, well, this is not satisfactory. This interpretation is not satisfactory for two reasons, right? So first of all, if you do believe this kind of, okay, there's omitted variable bias, then really what you care is the sign of the omitted variable bias, right? So why you have mm -hmm. basically here, you can see why is it, excuse me. Yeah. So why is it that you can kind of so here you can see the omitted variable bias is that if you omit a variable by omit this controls, you're going to underestimate, right? So why this would happen? Then you need to think, you need to argue, oh wow, the sign of the omitted variable bias is really like positive and this is an upward trend. But the thing is, here in this data set, the sign of the omitted variable uh, omitted variable bias is really not clear. Because if you want to, you know, justify the sign is positive in this case, then you really need to analyze the relationship, the correlation, right? The correlation between the treatment and those control variables and the correlation between these control variables and, and the corruption, right? But here it's really not clear, right? Why you would have this positive, positive trend, right? Why you would you know, have this, you know, you know, this this kind of automated, the sign of the automated bias, because you, you think, okay, maybe, right, those mayors, maybe you, you could come up with a story that, okay, maybe the second term mayors, they're more experienced or they're more educated, right? So they're more likely to get reelected. But whether these more experienced mayors are more likely to be corrupted or they are actually more honest, Actually, you don't have, you know, you don't have a clear story to tell what is exactly the correlation. So it's not exactly clear why, right, in this kind of data set, you know, the trend, the omitted variable bias is positive so that you have this upward trend. So it's not very clear. So that is the conundrum we have for this kind of data set. And more importantly, right, if you do believe this is a very good natural experiment, it's, you know, enhance, you know, X and T, we should believe it that it only contains some mild selection bias. You wouldn't expect, you know, expect that it has this kind of upward trend, right? Because if you do believe, okay, there's a lot of bias, then I'm, you know, as a researcher, I will be really worried. Maybe this is not enough. You maybe you should throw in more controls. Maybe there are other, you know, bias as well that you have not taken care of. So obviously. So, so what I'm trying to say here is that, well, you could try to justify from the perspective of the omitted bias, but it's not satisfied here, satisfactory here, because you know it's a natural experiment. It, you know, we would expect that the selection bias yeah. is mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Quick question. Yes. Quick yeah. Question. So, um, so do you do we have to count on an assumption that these uh, additional variables uh, are totally independent? Of each other, and particularly with the treatment, because I think you're doing incremental. And uh, how do you disentangle some of the common variants being explained by, by all these variables? And if we do the interactions, and will that be different? 
Yeah, I think I'm. Yeah, oh. I'm just. Yeah, I'm, so I that's absolutely a good question, question, right? So, so, yeah. the, so, so the the correlation, right? So about these controls, uh, that they're, they're mm. definitely not independent. So the correlation mm -hmm. between these control variables makes the analyze makes the analysis of the admitted variable even more difficult. So even more difficult, you cannot. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. it makes mm -hmm. it even mm -hmm. more difficult for you to tell exactly what is the sign of the admitted mm -hmm. bias. So that's exactly makes mm -hmm. the problem. You know, if you do if you do OLS, you try to justify it in this way. It's yes. even harder to justify. Mm -hmm. Right, because you know, yeah, because the correlation of all these control variables, right, it's yeah. even more complicated. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, another, another quick question yeah. here. Yeah. Uh, could you turn back to the page of the the, the, the diagram, the graph? Yes. Uh, could you just quickly explain the um, the x axis? So you have the number. There is a mayor characteristic twenty one. And yeah. The so there are twenty one mayor characteristics, like twenty one variables. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so the 28 municipal characteristics is the 28 is the is the total number of is the total number of controls. That municipal. means it's mayor characteristics plus municipal characteristics. In total, it's 28. Okay. So so now so here I add political institution characteristics that gives me a total of 32 control variables. All right. So, so now I add more accumulated yeah. number. There's four. Yeah, so that's accumulated. Exactly. All right. yeah. Yeah. So another so kind of mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah, we see a clear trend of the up upwards uh, is going up, mm -hmm. right? Uh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. And is it proportional? See, for example, mm -hmm. the political institution and then um, the difference is about yeah. 19,250, right? Yeah, and so it adds on the two that, yes. So it's not proportional, right? No. So, for example, yeah. the political, the political one, and it added that uh, like mm -hmm. nineteen thousand something, and yes, then, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's not so it's not proportional, right? So, so this is just what happens if added. they add twenty one mayor characteristics, it only increases mm -hmm. five thousand. If I add some, so here you add seven municipal characteristics, they increase this much, but now here you only add like four in jumps this much. So it's not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Right. So, so the key point is, well, for this kind of data set, you wouldn't expect to have such a trend, but it happens. And the danger is mm -hmm. you try to interpret it yeah. from the mm -hmm. omitted bias, thinking, oh, there is yes. a bias mm -hmm. in my data set. Mm -hmm. However, what I'm trying mm -hmm. to argue is, it might not be the case that the data set contains bias. It could be simply mm -hmm. you're using a bad estimator. Because when you have many controls, mm -hmm. you're not able to capture the estimation error very precisely, and it will also happen. So it's not like this is a you know mm -hmm. this is a bad it's a bad data set that contains a lot of bias. Simply because you are using a bad estimator for good data sets. So this is we're trying to argue. Mm -hmm. So right. So I think so this really motivates you know, what ideally what we want for a good estimator, right? So we want, so once you have many controls, we want have an estimator that is more robust, right? So that is more robust. More robust means it's not too sensitive to the use of many different controls, right? So ideally we want an estimator that should be able to produce stable estimates if the data set is indeed coming from good natural experiment which contains mild selection bias. If the data set features severe bias, of course, then added controls should correctly reduce the estimation error. So in this talk, so I'm going to show you a new estimator, which is a new variant of the balancing estimator that might be able to achieve these goals better than other modern approaches. So, mm -hmm. so the, the new estimator I'm trying to, give, to introduce today is exactly an estimator that is more robust you know, to many different controls and will be able to give you a more stable estimate. So in this case, so so now I apply my estimator, right? The new balancing estimator. So if I do not use any controls, just mean comparison, this is that much. So not very different from, you know, what you see from OLS. But now once I gradually add more and more controls, as you can see, actually the trend disappears. It does not have that strength. So here, green means it actually drops, right? So once I right add, so I do the same exercise. I gradually add controls. I add 20 
right? So here you have 21 control add mayor characteristics. Actually, the asymmetry even drops a little bit at municipal characteristic, it drops a little bit more, but once I add political institution characteristic, it goes back. And then once I add this more and more, this lottery dummy variables, it does not change at all. So you can see once I use this new estimator, actually this kind of trend disappears. Right. So this is what actually I think ex ante researchers are expecting. All right. So so you can compare what happens when you use this OLS estimator and this is a new estimator. So what I'm trying to argue is that, well, for the OLS estimator, it's not that the data really contains bias. It's simply because with many regressors, OLS fails to control the estimation error, estimation error measured in terms of mean square error effectively. So it fails to control the mean square error effectively. So therefore, you can, you know, it fails to control estimation error. So what you see is simply the estimation error instead of the real bias. And because of this, you know, if you, you if you use OLS, where you have many control variables, then it ha it has a risk that it can cause many empirical risks, many empirical results to be misinterpreted, right? Because here, if you see this and you OLS, you will think, oh, there is large bias in my data set, but in reality, it is this. So, so, so if you use my estimator, it's actually this, and I know. I can show theoretically that my estimator is better in the sense that it actually controls mean square error as best as we could. So we have theoretic support that to show that this estimator performs really well for empirical study for observational studies with many controls. So I think you know what you see here is not really omit variable bias, but it's simply you're just using the wrong estimator. Because we have many controls, you know, OLS is just not effective anymore, right? So, so now, so what I'm going to motivate a bit more, you know, what this new estimator has done differently, okay? Um, so, so imagine, right, a researcher who is thinking about using a set of control variables, including technical terms like the interactions or square terms in their analysis. And because of the rich set of conditional terms, they think, okay, I'm happy with exogenous condition and I'm willing to assume unconfoundedness, right? So they think that, they, you know, once I have these controls, they think the data is exogenous. So, so now what we, our estimator, the new balancing estimate has done differently is tries to mitigate the mean square error resulting from the presence of these many control variables and technical terms, right? But you can imagine once you throw in a lot of controls, variables in your regression, you know, it's much more difficult to estimate. So the, the goal is now we try to mitigate the mean square error resulted from these control variables. So you can, you know, so, so we can actually show, you know, what this estimate has done differently. So it acknowledges the need to trade off the finite sample mean square error optimally, right? So not only, so here you just say, because mean square error is controlled the bias and the variance. So essentially, you know, what this data, you know, what this estimator is thinking is, well, not only should you care about the bias in your data set, but you should also worry about the estimation variance, right? If you, 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 if you use OLS, you only care about the bias, but here what you really should care is not only the bias, but also the variance of estimator. So you need to trade off these two sources in the optimal way. And that's exactly what this new estimator is doing. And so in finite sample, this estimator essentially, you know, controls the mean square error in finite sample. And also asymptotically, we can also show it's efficient. So this estimator, we can show it has some really nice properties that, I, that OLS does not have. And most importantly, it is extremely easy to implement. So, so actually, you know, it's as easy as OLS, as you see later, it's as easy as OLS, but it has much more, you know, it has like much better properties, it's better properties. So I just want to convince you, you know, when you have many controls, you should really use this kind of, you know, this new balancing estimator and it performs much robustly compared to, OL, you know, a default OLS estimator. 
so um so this is you know the the motivation right um for so this is exactly the motivation for for new, new estimator and i'm going to call this new estimator as the mean square error optimal balancing estimator so there's a lot of jargons here but later um, hopefully um you are going to see you know um what we mean by mean square optimal what we mean by balancing okay so what we find is that this kind of new balancing estimator it behaves more robustly for the real data set of Ferenc Nufenan 2011, so this data set, but it actually, and also it out, outperforms other modern approaches in terms of mean square error in a variety of simulations. So I did, so not only it behaves well for this single real data set, I did a lot of simulations. It also outperforms other modern approaches. So we believe it is a more robust estimator and it's a more suitable for moderately high dimensional data set. So if you have an administrative data set that has a lot of controls, also has a lot of observations, so such an estimator is, you know, so this new balancing estimator is more, you know, more suitable, can to you know, can can give you a more precise estimate compared to this default method like OLS. So um so this is the so the, you know so basic property of this estimator so what i'm going to do now you know, so this is a, you see the empirical example so what we could do what i'm going to do now is you know to introduce you this new balancing estimator and what exactly it has done differently compared to existing method but because this kind of balancing the um, approach is a relatively new addition so i'm going to you know, lay some groundwork. So, so first we are going to thinking. So we are going to be thinking uh, about causal effect in a more rigorous way. So by introducing this kind of, you know, this very popular potential outcome model, and then we're going to be focusing introducing some treatment effect called average treatment effect. And then I'm going to intro, you know, talk, review some simple estimators that probably um, that you know, like simple difference in means estimator, and a very intuitive estimator would be matching. And now I'm going to, after review, I'm going to introduce mm -hmm. the new estimator, which is the, the balancing estimator. So it's actually, I believe, it is very intuitive, and also you can just view it as a very, you can view it just a matching estimator, but it's going to be going to help you do matching in a more effective and more flexible way so this so this new kind of balancing estimator that I'm, we are talking about here today you can think of you know you can think about it as a generalized a more general matching estimator right and then i'm going to talk about the mean square error optimal balancing which is you know approximate balancing because in this situation it makes you know you're not going to do balance exactly. You're going to do balance approximate. So I'm going to introduce this as um, this new class of estimators later. And then I'm, if I have time, I'm going to show you more empirical assimilation evidence. So this is um, the framework for, for the rest of the talk. So I don't know how much I can cover, but we can, you know, we can just proceed. So I think here, so here, I think um, the key, I think the, the mess, key message here is, you know, we need to think about estimating cause of some causal effect in a more rigorous way and think about when we have more you know many controls how do we you know estimate this causal effect more effectively so that's the goal of the causal of, of causal inference right so first um so let me introduce um uh, uh, the, the a causal model called potential outcome model which has been used which has been extremely popular and then a very popular cause of effect is called average treatment effect. So now we're just going to focus on how do we estimate this average treatment effect. In the, in the data set that you just saw, the average treatment effect is just the average amount of corrupt, you know, average, the average of money that will be stilled by the second term mayor compared to the first term mayor, right? So that is the average treatment effect there. So in order to study this kind of causal effect or causal, in, you know, causal effect, you know, Rubin, you know, has, you know, proposed this potential outcome model, which has been really success, success, successful and has literally been applied everywhere. So what we're thinking is there's, we have a sample 
of n units from a very large population. So we collect n units, let's say n individuals from very large population. So for each unit, there's going to be a treatment indicator, right? So the, the binary treatment indicator D equals to one means the, the individual is being treated. D equals to zero means it is not treated, which means it is in the control, right? So each individual has, you know, could be treated or not treated. And so therefore, the, each individual is going to be associated with two potential outcome, right? So Y zero is the potential outcome when the individual is not being treated. Y one is the potential outcome when I is treated, right? So you imagine, right, there's going to be a treatment. I'm going to treat this person or not. So now each person is going to have two potential outcomes. Right. So what would happen to this person if it is being treated? Y1 and what would happen to this person if it's not being treated? So that's Y0. So Y1 and Y0, these are two potential outcomes in economics. We call it counterfactuals because both of them are potentially observable to you before the treatment happens. But after treatment, you can only after, you know, you can only observe one of them because each individual, it can only be treated or not treated, right? So, so this is what happens, right? So th this is, I think this graph, it really illustrates what we mean by counterfactuals or the two potential outcomes, right? So you're thinking about each individual here, there are two paths, right? You can either be treated or not treated, but once you are, but you can only take one path, right? You can, potentially you have two paths, but you can only take one way, right? Once you take this path, you know what would happen to you when you walk on this path on the left, but you never know what is going to happen to you when you actually walk to the right, right? So for each person, you have two potential outcomes, but once you take the treatment, you only observe what happened to you under that particular treatment, right? So, so you, each person have these two potential outcomes, but you only observe one of them after treatment, right? So that is what is difficult about potential, you know, about the causal, causal uh, measuring some causal effect, right? So we are also going to assume some assumptions to effectively measure some, what, to measure causal effect. So here we maintain the stable unit. It's a bit mouthful. Basically it's called the stable unit treatment value assumption. So basically means, you know, so while well, in words, it means the potential outcomes for any unit do not vary with the treatment assi treatments assigned to other units. And for each unit, there are no different forms or versions of treatment level, which lead to different potential outcome. It's a bit mouthful, but really what it means is that there's no interference and there's no hidden variations of treatment, right? So first, no interference means my treatment is not going to affect your treatment, right? So that kind of exclude this kind of network effect or spillover effect, right? So if you think about taking vaccinations, so that kind, right? What is the effect of having a vaccination? So that obviously violates this, right? So um, you could think about if I get vaccinated, that might actually help protect you. So actually there is going to be an interference. So there's going to be a spillover. So obviously that does not apply here and we're not going to assume here. And also there's going to be no hidden variation of treatment. So that means when we talk about two treatments, there are really two treatments and no others. So you think about, you think about the treatment at taking an aspirin pill. So either you take one pill or no pill. You cannot split the pill into half and half, say I take zero point half pill, right? I take half of the pill. It shouldn't happen here, right? So here, the assumption we are going to maintain in order to measure treatment effect, some causal effect is there's going to be no interference and no hidden variances of treatment. There's only two treatments here and there's no interference between different individuals. Obviously, this is strong assumption and there's a really an active research in, you know, there's, there's an active line of research um, in economics and the causal inference to study how to measure causal effect that, go, that, that violates this assumption. But here, we're going to maintain this assumption, which is, argue, you know, we admit it is strong, right? So after 
once we make these assumptions, now we can measure individual causal effect, right? So we can measure the individual treatment effect as theta one, right? So this is the individual treatment for individual I, which is just the difference between Y one and Y zero for that individual, right? So, so this is what I'm, right? This is very intuitive because this is what, what is going to happen to me if I'm treated. This is what is happening, Y zero is what is happening to me when I'm not being treated. So the difference is the treatment effect, right? However, what is complicated is that the observed outcome, you only observe one of them because the observed outcome would be if you are not being treated, then I observe one zero. But 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 by definition, I never observe what is Y1. If on the other hand, if I'm being treated, I observe Y1. I observe what happens to me if I'm being treated, but I never observe what would happen to me if I'm not being treated, right? So that is the key challenge in causal inference because each individual can only take one treatment. You cannot take two treatments, right? You are either being treated or not treated. So once you do that, I only observe one, one of the two potential outcomes. So you don't observe the other, the other right? If I'm being treated, I know what is happening if I'm treated, but I don't know what would happen to me if I'm not being treated. So therefore, this kind of individual treatment effect, you can never learn it, right? Because for each individual, mm -hmm. you know, I can only observe one observed outcome, right? So, so the, the key insight here is, if you want to measure the causal effect for each of the individual, Forget about it because you can never learn it because I never observed other half of you. What would happen to mm -hmm. you, right? Um, oh, do I have any questions? Quick interjection too. Yeah. Quick interjection. So yeah. this will assume there will be no mediation, no moderation, and totally yeah. uh, attributed to that treatment. Yeah. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's a very strong right. yeah. assumption. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a very strong yeah. assumption. But I think um, there's an active research going on to, to, let's say, because obviously that means there's no spillover, no network effect. And obviously, all this, mm -hmm. you know, every day there mm -hmm. is yeah. a kind mm -hmm. of network effect. So that is strong assumption. But mm -hmm. um, so there's active research going on there. Um, I'm not going to talk about that. But, but yeah. yes, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. but, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, you can think about how you relax these conditions. Yes, yes. Mm. So because for each, in the, right, so this kind of individual treatment effect, you can never learn it because I only observe what happened to you to, to one of, right, one of the potential outcome. So therefore, if you want, if we want to learn about some sort of average treatment effect, we have to, you know, basically gather the strength from multiple units, right? So because now I observe your outcome, I observe my outcome. So as a whole, maybe I have some chance to learn about some sort of causal mm -hmm. effect, right? So, right. So, so now some sort of treatment effect can be learned, right? Exactly, right. The tr treatment effect among some certain population groups can be learned. For example, the focus of the, this talk will be average treatment effect, right? Average treatment effect is basically fine as the average individual treatment effect. So, right, so inside the expectation is the individual effect, which cannot be learned, but on average, this is going to be on average, what is the treatment effect for this whole population? We can learn about it, okay? There, there are ways we can learn about it, right? So there are also other treatment effect we can learn. For example, the tre average treatment effect on the treated, or local average treatment effect, which you know is some other sort of treatment effect, or the conditional average treatment effect, which is the treatment effect for the X here is some observable characteristics like demographic information. So this is the treat average treatment effect, say for those individuals who is a male or who is a female or who has an education level of 10 years, right? So this is the conditional average treatment effect. So this is the treatment effect for those particular group of individuals. But you can see there's a common similarity among this, all these kinds of treatment that can be learned. It's not about each individual, right? All the treatment effect is about a group of people, 
right? Because individual treatment of that, you cannot, you can never learn about it, okay? So now for this talk, we're going to focus on average treatment of that, right? So you think about a data set for the Faraz and Fena. So this, you know, so you could think about Y1 as the amount of money stolen by the first term mayors and Y0 as the amount of money amount of money stole by, stolen by the second term mayors. So on average, what is the difference? So this is the average treatment of that, right? So this is going to be the focus of our talk, okay? So, but not yet, okay? So in order, even if we focus on average treatment of that, it's still very challenging um, because, you know, even if we have these multiple units, it's still very difficult to measure, to precisely measure a causal, to say average treatment effect, because first of all, right, the assignment mechanism is unknown to you. In a, so it is a missing data problem. So I observe some being treated, some not being treated, but I do not know how the treatment status, D equals to one or zero, it is being allocated there. And second, what is difficult here is that each individual might have a different treatment effect. If each individual have a different treatment effect, this we say this, you know, your treatment effect can be different from my treatment effect. So if that is different, that there is heat treatment heterogeneity, and that will make our problem even more difficult, right? So to illustrate to you why this, you know, these two are important. So I'm going to illustrate to you why this assignment of mechanism of the treatment status is. Um, it's very important here, okay? Um, think about, um, suppose that some patients are sent to an emergency room for some medical treatment, okay? And then the doctors have two, the doctors have two treatments of treatments avail available. It's either to apply surgery or apply drugs, right? So now, suppose we are the God, so we know what is the treat, what we know what is the potential outcome for these two treatments. For, so suppose there are four patients and we know what is the potential outcome. So for patient one, if it is applied drug, let's say the outcome is one. If you applied surgery, the outcome is seven. So the individual has a treatment effect is six. So suppose the outcome, if you have a higher outcome, it's the larger the number, the better. So obviously you can see the treatment is positive here. So obviously, you know, it is effective for, for patient one. Enough with patient two, right? If it's applied for drug, the outcome is six. And if, if you apply a surgery, the outcome is five. So the difference would be minus one. So it's negative. Once now you can, this is for, this for, this is for patient three. So it has a positive treatment effect. This patient four is a negative treatment effect. So on average, you can see the average treatment effect is just the average of these four numbers. So on average is positive, right? So that means in reality, right? So this is what happens in, this is re in reality. So this on average, there's a positive treatment effect. However, suppose the doctors know what is the each individual's optimal treatment and apply this optimal treatment to each patient. And then let's think about what is the observed outcome, okay? So you can see here, right? So for this person, obviously the better treatment is one, which is the surgery. Suppose the doctor knows it. So, he, so the doctor will apply treatment one to the person. So what you observe is the seven that is being treated, right? Seven. And you can see for the patient two, obviously, you know, the, this one is better, right? So Y0 is better. That means applying drugs is better, right? So now it's going to apply treatment zero. So now the observed outcome is six. So now for patient three, you can see again, right? It's positive. So Y1 is a better treatment. So suppose the doctor is going to apply Y1. So the treatment is, treatment fact is five. Right. So now for the patient four, the optimal treatment is because Y0 is larger, it's going to be Y0. So it's going to be applying Y0. So what you observe is eight. Right. So each individual is going to be allocated this actual treatment status, which is optimal decided by the doctor. 
But now, if you just take a simple average of the observed outcome, what you realize, oh, the average different, right? You, right? So you can see on average, the effect of being treated, because these two get treated, you take an average of these two minus the average difference, the average outcome of those being not treated, which is six and eight. You take the average. So this is your, let's say, you ignore the treatment status, just estimate by the difference between average outcome for the treated and average outcome for the not treated. And now you can see you're going to draw a very completely different conclusion. Oh, it's minus one. So actually, the you know the average treatment effect is negative. So actually, the surgery is not effective. If you right, which is completely different from what you the true what is true here. So the true here is actually the true treatment of average treatment is actually positive. But if you ignore the treatment assignment mechanism here, if the treatment mechanism assignment mechanism is that doctors know what is the optimal treatment, and you, then you are going to draw a completely different conclusion. So I think this example, just to show you, right, if you want to learn about some treatment effect, precisely average treatment effect, you need to be careful about how the treatment assignment status is allocated or is, mm -hmm. is selected, mm -hmm. right? So that is the one main mm -hmm. problem, one main challenge in causal inference, right? And the second challenge, which is about I'm also going to give you an example that, that why the outcome heterogeneity is important. And this is actually very popular these days in, in economics. So, right, the example is, well, it is common, right, as we see, right, it is common for applied economists to run a regression. I just run a regression of Y on the treatment D and add a bunch of, add a bunch of controls and just report the estimated coefficients theta hat. So even if the data is exogenous, as shown by Angrist, that you actually, if you write down this specification, in general, you're not actually estimating average treatment effect, but actually a weighted version of the treatment effect. That is to say, right, if you write down the, this regression and you're thinking you're estimating average treatment effect, and in, in general, you're wrong because actually, you know, each individual has different treatment effects, individual treatment effect. So what you're actually estimating is an average, weighted average of this conditional average treatment effect, where this weight is proportional to the variance of the treatment standard. So basically this says, you write us this regression, if each individual has a different treatment effect, right? If, right, if this y1, y less by zero is not a constant, then, you're not actually measuring average treatment effect. You're measuring something else, right? So if you really want to be rigorous about the causal inference, right, you shouldn't run this regression. You should just, right, because you only estimate the average treatment effect if it's, you know, everyone has the same treatment effect, if it is constant. But obviously we, think, we know this is not realistic because everyone is different. Your treatment effect is different from my treatment effect. Right, could be could be different from my treatment. So here, right. So I this I mean these two examples to, to just to show you, right. If we really want to study causal effect more rigorously, we need to take care about two things. One is we need to think about right how the treatment mechanism is generated in the data set, and secondly, we need to allow each individual to have different treatment effect because. That is a more realistic situation, right? Now, given this causal framework, where let's say we are interested in estimating some average treatment effect. So, what I'm going to illustrate is first, I'm right. I'm going to illustrate this very simple difference in means estimator, right? So, this is a very simple estimator, right? So. I, I, and then we're going to think about, you know, under what circumstances this estimator, you know, is a valid estimator for average treatment effect, right? So here we're interested in estimating average treatment effect, which is the expected difference between these two potential outcomes, 
right? So you think about this is the average effect of the amount. This is average amount of money stolen by the first term mayor, and this is the average amount of money stolen by the second mayor. And the difference is the treatment effect that we care about. What we observe is we have we observe the. Um, so what we observe is the well. First, we have this binary treatment. We observe whether each individual is being treated or not, and we also observe their pretreatment covariate vector. So this is just the control variables. I have k control variables. You, you, you think about these as you know these kind of demographic information, you know these kind of things, and then what we also observe is the observed outcome. Right, so the observed outcome. Notice this is not the potential outcome. Is you know so this is observed outcome, which is the you know mixture of y one and y zero. Right. Sorry. So I just apologize. This is a slight inconsistency of an occasion. So here y one is just the this y one bracket. This y zero is just this y zero. Okay. So apologies for that. Mm. But basically, this is you only observe one. Right. Observe one of these two you can never observe both of them for each of the individual so this yeah. is this mm -hmm. observed outcome right so the simple mm -hmm. difference in, in the means estimator if i want to estimate the average treatment fact it's just this so this just says well i'm just going to go naively right so i'm just going to take an average of those individuals who are being treated take their average and then i'm going to take an average of those who have not been treated and then look at what is happening to them, right? So this is the average outcome for those being treated because D, you can see it because here this is D and if it's one, it's Y1, it's YI. So that means it's being treated and the equals to Y1. And this, if it's zero, it's zero, right? So here, if it's one, this is zero. If it's, right, mm -hmm. if, it's if it's zero, mm -hmm. you observe Y, mm -hmm. which is Y zero. So this is just mm -hmm. the difference between those treated and being, uh, being controlled, right? So for example, um, right? So if you look at the last six observations, so this is actually the real data set, okay? So this is the last six observations from the Faraz and Fernand data sets that we just talked about. So you can see, so this is the, you know, these are the six mayors. So for each, of the mayors, what you actually observe is their treatment status. So this is the first term mayor, or oh, sorry, this is the second term mayor, second term mayor, first term mayor, second term mayor, second term mayor, first term mayor, right? So for this, right, right for example, for individual unit one, it's not being treated. So you also observe the observed outcome because it's not being treated. So what you actually observe is their potential outcome of y0 but you don't observe the y1 right because they have not mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're not being treated and similarly for this this individual so for this mayor as well right so it's not being treated so the observed outcome is zero so that means this this mayor is serving the second term and it and we find it didn't steal any money it didn't steal any money and for this mayor it's serving the second term it steals four point nine seven percent of the total funds available to him right so right so this person the, this mayor it is being treated that means it's for serving the first term and he didn't steal anything right so in this situation because it's been treated what you observe is the y1 and you do not observe mm -hmm. the y0 mm -hmm. right so you can see so this is for each individual so you can see for each of the mayor you only observe one of the potential outcomes but you don't observe the other half, right? So there's always a part that is missing, right? So the simple mean indifference estimator is just to say, well, I'm just going to forget about these missing data that I do not observe. I'm just talking to take an average of what I actually observe, right? So for Y1, I observe these two because these two mayors, they've been treated. So I know the potential outcome is zero. So it's just zero. So now for these, four mayors that is being so these four mayors that is in the control right it's in the control group it's not being treated so i observe the potential outcome on the y no, potential outcome y zero right so now i take an app simply just take the average and i add right so that's one 2.06 
So the simple in the difference in means estimator is just minus 2.06, right? So this is, right, just simply take average of those being treated and being controlled and then look at the difference. So any yeah so um so this is what is the simple mean indifference estimator, right? So mm -hmm. now we're going to think about well, what is the property of this estimator? Is it really a good estimator, right? So here are some conclusions, right? So you can see, like I can easily show by law of large numbers, this is the sample average for those being treated. So if the sample size is very large, right, it's just going to converge to this. So essentially what you're estimating is the average of the potential outcome Y1 for those being treated, right? Because I'm taking the average of Y1 for those being, right, of Y1 of being mistreated. So you can only observe, you could, so essentially what you're actually estimating is the average of Y1 for those treated, right? So that's exactly, what you're doing here. So for the second part, what you're estimating, right? Because you only observe those being not treated and you take an average. So what you're actually estimating is the potential outcome of Y0 for those who are not being treated, right? For those in the control group. Therefore, what is, if you do apply this simple mean indifference estimator, what you're actually estimating is not average treatment effect, but the difference between this is the average of Y1 for those being treated, and this is the average Y0 for this not being treated, and you look at their difference, right? So this is obviously, in general, different for what you want. What you want, right, is the expectation of Y1, the difference between yep. the, the average of Y1 and Y0. So if you focus on, well, I'm interested in, the, so essentially you're interested in, in these two expectations, for expectation of Y1, this is what you want, but what you're estimating is the expectation Y1 for those being treated. So these two are different, right? So this is right what we call a selection bias, right? So in general, these two mm. will be different. So yeah. this mm. is going to be a selection bias. However, if the potential outcome is independent of the treatment assignment D, for example, the treatment is randomly assigned, then because this is randomly assigned, so the expectation of Y1 conditioned on D equals one is just going to be expectation of Y1 because D is independent of Y1, right? Then this will be equal to this, uh, also, and this will also be equal to this, right? So if the treatment is randomly assigned, then Y1, expectation Y1 equals to this, equals to expectation of Y1 given D equals to one and expectation of Y0 is going to equal expectation Y0 given D equals to zero. So if the treatment is randomly assigned, then you are good because then, you know, this estimator actually is going to be a consistent and unbiased estimator average treatment. However, in general, mm -hmm. Because the data is observed, it's not it's mm. it's not an experimental data, right? It's observational, so mm. we don't know how the treatment assignment mechanism is generated. Mm -hmm. So it's rarely known, and usually, it's not going to be random, right? So this mm. difference, so this simple difference in means estimator is going to be biased, mm. right? And then you're going to mm. have this selection bias. So now I'm going to be a bit slow, so you can see what we mean by selection bias. It's simply that we are worried that, well, this is what you can estimate, right? For expectation mm -hmm. of Y1, you, you, can estimate, you can estimate its average of Y1 for those being treated. But I'm worried this group of people who are being treated is different from the group of people, what, from the group of people that I actually care about, which is the whole population, mm -hmm. right? What I'm care about mm -hmm. is not the treatment effect for being treated, but the whole population. So these two groups of people, those being treated and the whole population, they can be different. Therefore, there's going to be a selection bias, right? So because yeah. these two groups yeah. of people are different, yeah. Yes. Good I, question. I, yeah. I think that's that uh, you explained very well about um, the random assignment part and uh, 
um, tell the difference between observational data and also experimental data. You can have better control and selection and uh, yeah. particular application and the treatment. But one thing you can also look into is to, number one, you have a larger N, okay? Yeah. So larger N then get, uh, can have two advantages. Uh, one is uh, you can alleviate or, or, or dilute um, that uh, small sample uh, uh, bias, and uh, particularly yeah, when yeah. you uh, mm -hmm. have no control of the, uh, of the treatment process, uh, treatment assignment process. Now, the other one is that, uh, um, how much you can uh, look into the variance. So um, the mean indifference method have uh, account have been relying on uh, how much the variance could be comparable or generally equal. So uh, then we can we can directly address or maybe at least to detect the heterogeneity problem. If the yep. variance are really significant or different, and uh, then would that would that be something we can do? Yeah, so I think that's absolutely a uh, great question. So I think there are two parts here. So one, you talked about the sample size, right? So the mm -hmm. yes, if you have a larger sample size, you can address yeah. mm -hmm. the small sample property, but you mm -hmm. cannot eliminate this selection bias because even if you have a very large number of observations, what you can only estimate is the expectation of Y1 given Yd0, right? So this is exactly what is going to happen when M becomes large. So this is going to happen yeah. if any is very large, yeah. what well, you can ultimately estimate, if I have infinite amount of data, mm -hmm. I can only estimate yeah. the expectation of Y1 given D equals to one, right? Even yes. if I have a large mm -hmm. data, mm -hmm. because essentially yeah. you don't, you never observe what would happen, right? Uh, for mm -hmm. you never observe yeah. what is yeah. the Y1 for those who are not being, right? Yes. For those who are mm -hmm. missing, right? Mm -hmm. So this is, mm -hmm. right? So that's the, this kind of selection bias, it cannot be, you know, eliminated by oh, the totally larger eliminated. Sentence, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because, yeah. you know, I only have information for those who are being treated, right? But my target mm -hmm. population is the whole population. It's not those who've been treated. So this yeah. difference mm -hmm. cannot be addressed by simply having larger data set without being, mm -hmm. you know, right, a larger data set. Um, and the second one, I think that's absolutely great. So if the, the treatment assignment is randomly assigned, yes, this is, mm -hmm. a, you know, simple mean difference estimator is consistent and unbiased, but then probably you could mm -hmm. still reduce its variance, right? So I'm not saying it's yeah. the most mm -hmm. efficient estimator, right? So that's a really great question. So mm -hmm. actually you might be, so even if the treatment assignments is randomly assigned, you might be able to yeah. actually mm -hmm. reduce the variance of the simple, in the, in the, yes. uh, mm -hmm. simple mean the difference estimator by controlling the individual characteristics. Uh -huh. So you can mm -hmm. actually do that, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. so yes, but here, so I think I'm more concerned about a more serious problem because for observational data, the treatment assignment is not randomly assigned. Therefore, the first mm -hmm. part is I want to address the selection bias, which means, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those treated look different from this whole population, right? So mm -hmm. that's exactly now what we are going to think about. How do we, you know, eliminate this kind of selection bias, right? So I think the key insight here right, about selection bias, which is, right, there's going to be a difference between the group that you have data and the group about the group that you actually care about, right? So, so this is what essentially selection bias is, right? I think, I think I've, I've mentioned this a couple of times, right? If you want, for example, if you want to measure expectation, the average effect of Y1, you you cannot, you know, you don't have complete data. You only have data who, for those who are being treated, right? So, and then the problem is an average person from those being treated can look very different from an average person from the whole population. So that would give you selection bias, right? A more concrete example is, you know, in this Faraz and Fernand data set, you know, I want to look at, you know, the difference between the difference of the the amount of money stolen by this by those first term mayor and second term mayor. However, right, the the mayor serving the first term, right, so they've been treated. Their average outcome, right, so they might you know might be different because you know 
they might be less educated than an average person, average mayor in the whole population, right? Because you know, a mayor can only can can serve like two terms, right? A mayor serving the second mm -hmm. term that yeah. means they're reelected. Mm -hmm. So that means maybe they're more educated, mm -hmm. they're more easily to get reelected. So, so mm -hmm. you can see a mayor serving the first term can look different from the second term. So, so that means a mayor serving the first term can look very different from an average mayor that's drawn from the whole population. And that would give you mm -hmm. the selection bias, right? Because what you care about, the, what you care, which is the average of the whole population, is different from what you have data about, which is the population that is being treated, right? How, then if, right, so if that is, if, so how do we kind of remove this kind of selection bias is, so here's so how one way of doing it, right? So we're thinking, okay, if this kind of difference, right, between these two groups being treated and the whole population, if the, the difference that, or the selection bias is only related to observable variables, only related to the characteristic, then we can control selection bias just by comp comparing those individuals who look similar. Right. So here is the unconfoundedness condition that people usually impose for observational state, uh, ob observational data set. This just says, okay, even though the treatment is not randomly assigned, sometimes we are willing to believe that the treatment is randomly assigned or randomly so chosen. Now, conditional on or among those units that are observational are identical in terms of the pretreatment observer X. So that has to mean once I come, you know, even though um, you know, the treatment is not randomly assigned, once I focus on those individuals who look exactly the same, the treatment is randomly assigned among these individuals. So, so if we are kind of believing in this kind of philosophy, then if you want to estimate the average treatment effect, essentially what you can do is just to compare the outcomes of the individuals who look identical in terms of X, but, diff but identical in terms of X, but differ in their treatment status. And that is called matching, right? So that's exactly well, mm -hmm. how we're mm -hmm. going to um, remove um, selection bias, right? So here, so let me illustrate the, the, the idea of matching, which is um, it's, 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 it's really intuitive, right? So this is the same observations, this, I only list the six just for illustration purpose, right? So from Svenna. But now I'm going to, so these are color coded. So these greens, so they're being treated, we observe their Y1. So this red part, they're not being treated. So they're in a control group. So we only observe the Y0, right? So the problem is we don't observe their opposite treatment uh, potential outcome. So the idea is, well, I, I'm interested in the average treatment effect, which is the average between these two. Well, because I ob already observed one of them, so the idea is I'm just going to, to try to back out what is the other one, right? For example, for unit one, it's not being treated, and I observed the Y0. So all I need to think about is, well, you know, I'm just to have to have a guess about what is the Y1. Right, I'm going to have a guess about what we do about it. So now, well, I have some other information because I know what is, so suppose there's only one characteristic, there's only one control, which is the school schooling level. So now I observe that this mayor, right? So this mayor, you know, has an education level of six years. So now the idea is, well, can I find someone that's in the opposite treatment mm -hmm. group that look that, that look exactly the same as this paper, this mayor, right? And then I'm, the idea is I'm just, just going to use their outcome to back out this person's outcome, right? So now I look at it. Mm -hmm. So this person, mayor, is being in the control group that has a D equals to zero. So now it's school level, schooling level is six. So now, look at this third mayor, right? It is also has the same school level, schooling level, which is six years, but it's been treated. So these two persons look exactly the same, 
but they have the different treatments data. So they look the same. So I think this mayor, its potential outcome is also zero, right? Because they look exactly the same. The only difference is that the treatment status is different. This one is being treated, or this one is not being treated. So I observe Y zero. So I want to back out this Y one. So I'm going to borrow the information from the third unit, right? From the third unit, because it's Y one is going to zero. So I think its potential outcome of Y one for this person is also going to be zero because these two look the same. The only difference is that the treatment status is different. So I'm going to think, okay, this person is going to have a, a potential outcome of zero, right? So that is exactly the idea of matching, right? So now I'm going to do the same for the, set, for, for the, for the second mayor. For the second mayor, right, it is also in a control group. So I only observe the Y zero, right? But now I'm, I'm missing its Y one. But now I observe it has a schooling level of eight. So now ideally what I'm going to do is I'm going to search among those who are being treated who look exactly the same as this person who has eight years and use their outcome to, you know, to use, use their outcome as the outcome for Y1. But in this situation, because I only have two, right? I don't have... I don't have an individual that look exactly the same as this, this person, which has 80 years of education, because here I only have essentially, because the, these two treated have the same, same um, schooling level, which is six, right? So therefore, I don't have the one that looks exactly the same as this person. So these two individuals, the six years, is the next, is the second optimal, right? So this is the second, right? So this, these two individuals will automatically become the, the person that looks most similar to this person because I don't have any more data. So I think they're also, the outcome is going to be zero, right? So that applies for this, the, this, this mayor, this, um, so for this one as well, right? So for mayor four, right? It has, it's not being treated. So now it has schooling level two. Ideally, I want to look for someone who has this, you know, in a country, in a treatment group who has the same schooling level two, but here I don't. I mean, in the real data set, you have four, 400 observations. Probably you do have someone look exactly the same, but here I don't. So I'm just going to pick the six because that's the next best I can get. So it's just a zero, right? So if, so you can see now I can back out all those missing by matching who look very similar. So now these are become zero, right? So now I can back out Y1. So now I'm going to do the same thing for Y0, right? So for Y0, it's also very, it's very nice because you can see for mayor three, it's been treated. So I know what is its Y1. So all I want to figure out is what is Y0. So now in order to figure out what is Y0, so now I look at its schooling level, so it's six. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the group. I'm going to search in the other group who is being controlled, right? Who look exactly the same as this mayor who has six years of education, but they defer in a treatment status, right? So now you can see these two people, these two mayors, right? This mayor, right? Oh, actually this is only, right? This one mayor, right? You can see this mayor, look exactly the same as mayor number three. They have the same year of schooling. But now, right, the only difference is this is not being treated, this is being treated. So I think that they are the same, they look exactly the same. So the potential outcome of Y0 for this mayor that I can actually get, I'm going to apply it to this person, right? To this mayor, right? Because they, these two, you can see these two mayors, they look exactly the same. The difference is the treatment status. So I think, for, right, in order to figure out what is the Y0 for the third mayor, which I do not observe, I, I just use this information, 4.97, which is, which is the Y1, right, of this first mayor who look exactly the same as this mayor. The only difference is the treatment status. Right. So now I'm going to do the same thing for the last mayor, who is also the six years of education, but now it's 4.97. Right. So, uh, so now, so basically, so this is exactly what we mean by matching, which is essentially, right. So essentially, I 
back out the missing parts of the data by looking at those who look exactly the same as this person, but differ in their treatment status to figure it out, right? So once I backed out these outcomes, now I can take the average of, right? Because once I have backed them out, right? Back out all the missing, missing data. So now for Y1, I just take an average of zero. I mean, here it's all zero for the average of Y0. So now it's all this, it's 3.03. .03. So you can see the matching estimator actually is going to give you a different number here. Right, so this is exactly what we mean by matching, by uh, what we mean by matching essentially, right? Com right, compare the individuals that look similar but differ in their treatment status. Right, so I want to talk about, um, right, so that is my, the matching is very intuitive, but in order to kind of, um, let's see if we can get there, but, um, but in, I want to um, illustrate what is the insight of this kind of the matching estimator, right? If you take a naive average of this red data, right? Then what you're actually doing, right? So this is the naive simple mean difference in mean estimator. You just take a simple mean, right? So that means each of the outcome that you observe is going to get the same equal weight of one four, right? So one over four. Right, so this is what you mean. This is what you, you what you, you are going to get if you ignore, right? So the selection bias, just take the sample average. But now if you do matching, right? Essentially, you're still taking the sample average of these four numbers because this is the only information that you can get, you can you want you can learn about y0. You are still taking the average of these four numbers. Right, because right for this all this missing data, it's all still 4.97, 4.97. Right. You now, but now after matching, you're still taking the average of these four numbers, but now you're giving a different weight for these different these four numbers. Especially, let's say for the point for the for the value outcome 4.97, you're actually giving a higher weight, higher weight, right? Because there are three of them now you're giving a higher weight compared to ignoring mm -hmm. this, right? And why this is happening. Mm -hmm. Does this make sense? Well, I'm going to argue this actually makes a lot of sense because if you look at, right? If you look at, if you forget, let's say you forget about the missing data, you just take a simple average of these four numbers. What you actually, well, you give only one fourth weight to this outcome. Why is that? Mm -hmm. Well, because be among these treated individuals, the schooling level of sex only shows up once, right? So the probability, right, of X taking sex in the treated, oh, sorry, in a control group, so here I'm looking for the control group, only shows up once, right? So the weight, you, right, so you only give one over four weight. However, in the whole, what you actually care about the treat, you know, what you actually care is the average of Y0 in the whole population, not just being among those by control. However, in the whole population, you can see sex actually shows up more frequently. It actually shows up three times, right? So if you only focus those being treated, sex only shows up once, right? In terms of the characteristics, but now if you all focus on the whole population, it actually shows up three times. So that means, right, because now I care about the treatment effect in the whole population. So actually I should up give a more weight to the to, to 4.96 because, you know, be, simply just because, you know, in the whole population, there are more units with the schooling level six than in the, in the untreated population. Right, so I think that makes a lot of sense, right? In, because in the untreated population, there's only one individual who has unit, uh, who has outcome, who has one individual, one unit that has schooling level sex. But in the whole population, there are actually three. Therefore, you should overweight four point nine seven, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I think so. This is the instead of the matching. So I think that 
right? So, so essentially what you're doing is just take a different average of these four numbers, but you're going to take a different weighted average of this observed outcome using the weight that actually reflect the distribution of the X in the whole population, not the control population. And that's exactly how you remove selection bias, right? Because you can see, you know, I'm just going to right, repeat this, right? In the, you look at the distribution of X in a controlled sample, right? In untreated, right? Two shows up once, six shows up only once, eight shows up twice. While the distribution of X in the whole sample, including those being controlled and treated, two of course shows up once, eight still shows up twice, but now six shows up three times. So the distribution of X, the characteristic look different among the controlled sample, which you have data, right? To, for, uh, looks different from the control sample and the whole sample, which is what you really want to infer, right? I really want to estimate the, the effect of the whole population, not the controlled population. So therefore, I should use a weight that reflect the whole population, not using the weight about the controlled population, right? So therefore, I'm going to average outcomes by a weight that resembles the target population, which is the whole. Right? So you can see the weight I use here, right, here for the matching is exactly the weight here that reflects, right, so that reflects the distribution of X in the target population. That, that is why we, I care. I don't care about the, the, the controlled sample because I don't care the average effect of Y0 given DZ equals to zero. I care about the whole population, right? So you can see, right, so that's exactly what is happening here, right? So you can see 4.97, it shows up three times out of six. So I give him that, right? Zero, so zero, right? So here, zero. So for those who are having a school level eight, one of them is getting zero. One of them is getting 1.81. So I'm going to equalize. One of them gets, right? It show, so here it shows up, the total probability is two over six. I'm going to, but there are two people right, out of the sex, have the eight years of education, one of them having zero outcome, one of them 1.06, so I'm going to give them equal, give, going to give them an equal weight. I'm going to give them an equal weight, right, one over six, one over, mm -hmm. you know, one over six, and now for the, for the person who has um, eight years of education, uh, two years of education, it only shows up once, so it also only gets, like, um, here, it only gets one Wait. So you can see, right? You just compare to the naive sample mean. You still use it, taking a different sample mean, but now you're using a weight that actually reflect the distribution of the target population, because this is the target. This is the population. The whole population is the population that you care about. So that's exactly the insight of matching, right? So that's exactly the insight of matching and. So now coming through here, so now I think I'm in a position. So uh, I think I'm going to have to do this. So I'm going to skip this. So now I'm going to introduce um, balancing, which is exactly this idea of matching, right? So the idea of matching, but it's much more flexible, right? So now let's think about matching as an estimator. So, and I'm going to argue it's exactly like matching that we what, what we just did, but it's much more flexible. So you think about estimating the average treatment effect, right? Which is just the difference between Y1 over zero. So now I'm going to be focusing on, because it's just the difference between two averages, I'm going to focus on the average of Y1, because for average Y0, I can do the same thing, right? So now think about it. So what I care about is the average of Y1. So that is the mean of Y1 in the whole population but we only have information of Y1 in the treated population because I only observe Y1 for those who have been actually treated. So I only have information mm -hmm. for the treated population. So this is exactly the source of selection bias. And then, right, because the two groups look different, but now balance is exactly the idea 
that now I'm going to somehow make these two groups of populations that look, you know, a bit similar, so that more comparable that in a way that I can remove, you know, and then as, as a result, I can remove the selection bias, right? So, so now I'm going to go from matching to balancing, right? So, um, so you can, you can recall the simple sample mean estimator for Y1, right? You just take a naive sample, you know, sample mean, right? I'm just going to, for Y1, I'm just to take a naive sample mean who, for those being treated, right? So this is a naive sample mean. This is exactly as before, but now I'm going to slightly rewrite it, right? You can see it's just a simple average of Y, but now each observed, each treated is going to get the same weight, which is this, right? So everyone gets the same weight, right? So this is the same weight that you get if you take the sample mean, right? Everyone gets the same weight, but as we, as we have discussed, this naive weight, take the sample mean, to take naive average, it only works when D is randomly assigned. So that means there's no difference between the treated group and the whole population. And now we know matching adjust, right? If you do matching, essentially what you do is you are going to adjust this weight, right? Adjust this weight by a different weight function, by different weight that resembles the distribution of X in the whole population. And that's how you remove selection bias. So now from here, Right, this is the key idea of balancing. So now, if you, I realize, you know, what I care about is just to take a different sample average of this observed outcome. So now, what I'm going to do is, well, I'm just going to find a set of weight functions, right? Wxi, the weight of functions, such that I'm going to estimate expected value of y1 by this sample average using this different weight, using this different way, but now this weight is going to be selected such that the distribution of the covariates in the treated population after this adjustment look exactly the same as the distribution of X in the whole population, right? So I'm going to use this weight to directly adjust the distribution of X in the treated population so that it looks exactly the same as a whole population. If the, this condition is met, then we say the distribution X is balanced. So, in, and, this is, and this is nice because that just means, right, what we are doing is we're just going to adjust outcome by a set of weight that is going to make the treated and the whole population indistinguishable. And that's how you, we think we can remove the selection bias. Because, you know, we, the key thing about the selection bias is that it's treated and the whole population looks different. But now, if I adjust the distribution such that they look exactly the same, then there's no selection bias because these two group people look exactly the same, right? So that's the key idea by balancing. Um, so after this kind of adjustment, I'm going to look, I'm going to, make the distribution of X in the whole population exactly the same. This is what I care, the whole population. Look exactly the same as the distribution of X in the treated population. And they look exactly the same. So it looks as if it's a random experiment. So I could just take a sample average. But now it's a sample of average after adjustment by using this weight. So this is exactly essentially what we, do, what we did by matching. But now it's more flexible, okay? Right. So, but the key idea is how do we, you know, adjust the distribution of the covariates such that it's equal? Well, usually we just focus on the sample average of the covariates, right? So we just we just achieve we essentially we achieve balancing by equalizing the mean of the covariates in the treated and the whole population. Think about it, right? Before balancing. This is the sample mean of the controls <laughs> variable, all the controls in the whole population. So it's this, right? This is a sample average of the controls in the whole population, right? It's just, you take the average of the whole. And this is a sample mean of the controls in the treated population. Obviously, they will not, they will, they will not be the, the same, right? Because we are worried about selection bias, right? So these two averages will not look the same. But now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to choose a set of weights, W, 
to force them look the same, right? So I'm going to choose a weight such that the sample mean of the controls in the whole population now is going to look exactly the same. It's going to equal to the same to the sample mean of the controls in the in the in the control pop uh, in the treated population, but after adjust by you know after using this adjustment. They're going to. I'm going to force them to look exactly the same, because now after this adjustment, this you know they look exactly the same because this is the sample mean in a control whole population. This is adjusted sample mean of the controls for the for the treated population. So now they look the same in terms of the mean. So if you're happy, you, you're happy with this in a sense that after adjustment, the average of controls, the average values of control in the whole population is exactly the same to the average of controls in the treated population. If you're happy with this and you think I, you know, I'm happy with this and I think I should balance just by equalizing the mean, then and that's great, right? Because now they look the same. So now what you could just do is just to estimate the average of Y1, just, just take a sample average. But now it's after this, by you, you know, after adjustment of this, of this way. Right, so this is going to be a, again not a naive average, but now the weighted average of the observed outcome, where the weight is going to force this kind of balance. Yes. Yeah, I, I think for the interest of time, we do not. <laughs> we have another yeah. uh, fifteen minutes. I think um, can we maybe jump to the conclusion and then uh, maybe we can do some Q and A. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think yeah. that's. So I think yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I think I'm all, almost finished I, I'm here. But but I think yeah. this this is a key idea. I think we've got is just mm -hmm. to you know I'm just going to directly choose a set of weights just to to remove selection bias by making the treated and the whole population that look exactly the same, right? So that is the key idea. And then you know so this is going to then I'm going to how you select the weight. But now in the end. Right, so I have some simulation results, but basically, so this mm -hmm. is the conclusion. So it's so the so the estimator is going to be very simple, right? Um, so what we did in this talk is we have reviewed the balancing as a very effective method to estimate the causal effect for observational data. So if the number of covariate is very large, then you should use the mean square error optimal balancing estimator, which is even better because now it only controls finite sample mean square error, but now it well it controls finite sample error, but only balances approximately. And this kind of balancing estimator, it's extremely flexible and it's very simple and more robust compared to many other modern approaches. So I really encourage you to use this balancing estimator well, if you do have this kind of moderately high dimensional data set uh, in your research. So I don't have like time to illustrate the estimator, but you can see it's actually extremely simple. It's as easy as OLS. So I've got all the formula, so you could just apply it um, if you have some data sets in the future uh, that you want to apply, you know, you want to estimate some sort of treatment effect. And I encourage you to use this kind of balancing estimate. Okay. Yeah. So yes, yeah, I think um, so that's all. Yeah. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take that's interesting. some. Yeah. Very interesting. I think. Uh, sorry, I have to uh, interrupt you because of no, no, interest no. Yeah, of time. Thanks. I think yeah. there's uh, still a few slides yeah, that they look really, really good. And uh, but um, first of all, let me allow uh, uh, allow me to uh, invite uh, the Taiwan side. Do you have any questions uh, or any uh, suggestions or the comments? And uh, from Taiwan side first, and for the students in the US, and if uh, if you have any questions, uh, please type it up, or you can just uh, raise your hand or speak up and. Uh, and after the Taiwan side raised the questions, uh, Dr. Pen. Yes. Uh, yeah, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, let me start yes. with the uh, well, the latest topic. Well, first of all, thank you for walking through, uh, walking us through all this this process, and I think that's very clear. And one of the question is about the matching, the matching yeah. thing. Um, Yes, in practice, there are a few choices of filling the missing values when we treat with um, deal with data, right? And yeah, then, yeah. Uh, so how are they related to the matching methods you suggest? For example, like the series mean or mean or mean of a nearby point, things like that, median. 
So uh, the, the example you said that there, there are only six, right? We take the last six yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. pieces. But if there are more than that, and then we yeah so absolutely yeah so that's a great question so so in reality you have a lot of the covariates right so what happens in reality is because you have a lot of covariates so it's rare that you can actually find individuals that look exactly the same as the one right because there's many covariates so most of the time you're not going to be able to find the one that look exactly similar so that so usually what we do so here is the general so i haven't talked about it so in general you're just going to look for an individual or several individuals that look most similar to to the individual that you're trying to back out its missing data yeah right? no, so for, it's right most similar so the most similar a, means that, in terms of the this right in terms of the covariates Right. So basically most similar is so let's say you want to back out. So the the let's say you want to back out. So suppose you take ice unit, right? So this ice unit, it's been treated, so you observe y1. So you want back out is y0, right? So what you do for y0, you are going what you're going to do is just going to, in order to figure out its y0, you're just going to take an average right. of the outcomes in those untreated group. Mm -hmm. That's that the covariate value look most similar to the covariate value of x y in terms of this distance between the covariate value between the covariate value and with between the covariate value of those who are being untreated and the and the covariate value that you are looking for for x i. Okay. So so, so take the so example this distance. Uh, yeah. Schooling. Yeah. Take the example of schooling, yeah. like uh, the schooling of six years. And then if yeah. let's say uh, we have uh, uh, 50, uh, 50 mayors that with the 60 schooling level, and then they yeah. all come up with different Y. Oh, and so they just take the, the average. You just yes, simply, average. so they yes. all look exactly the same. So you, have you tried so you just take the average of different, different ways of, um, of the matching, say average is one, one way or so you mean have the average oh, of, okay. of school level of six or you know, because uh, uh, we we think about the, the the methods that fill the missing value. Yeah, there are a couple of choice, many, many uh, a few choices, right? Serious mean or the nearby points or the nearby points of yeah, meeting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, interpolated values, things like that. Um, yeah. So have you try you know, try to simulate the 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 effects of using different ways of matching? Um. So. I think so. So I think that's a great question. So first, let me address like the first. So if you do observe, let's say somehow in your data set, you observe there are 50 mayors that has. So suppose you only have one school like schooling level and you have you have found six, may, like 50 mayors that have the same one. Then you just take an average of those six. So if you use one of them, I think. I think that will be less robust because you usually want to take an average of all. So that's all the information. But I want to point out that scenario is very rare, right? Because, because as, as, as we as mentioned, it's not like you only have in the covariates, it's not like you only have the schooling level. You have the gender, you know, sure. their, you know, political party. You remember actually actually right for example for this data set actually you have 67 controls so it's very rare that you can actually match them exactly so usually what people do is just look for several or one or several individuals that look the most similar not exactly the same but most similar to them so that's what usually happens mm -hmm. and then um yeah so that's yeah that's one that's the first question and the second is have i tried like different matching methods so i think that's a great question because actually you can see if you think about this kind of process the, the causal inference process all the effective like causal estimators essentially they are different sort of matching estimators right because this is the only information mm -hmm. you have you just use different weight mm -hmm. right you just use different weight so so that so you just use different weight. So in some sense, this kind of balancing is, is in some sense the best matching estimator because that's exactly that's the estimator that exactly makes these two populations look exactly the same. So that kind of removes the selection bias perfectly in, the, in that sense. All right, thank you. And uh, yeah. can I add, ask another question here? 
Yeah, sure, absolutely. Go ahead, uh, go ahead please. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's about a data set, though. Um, it's kind of a hypothetical yeah. question. The the corruption yeah. study, uh, it was based on a cross-sectional data, right? Uh, taken yeah. 2003, yeah. uh, no, 2013. And then, hypothetically, if the data were like um, time series or panel data, would it help to get better estimates for the... Um, I'm not sure if it's a question. Uh, no, that's a great question. No, yeah. I think here it only applies for cross-sectional. So mm -hmm. um, strictly speaking, that's not applied to um, panel data because for panel data, essentially what you end up with, I mean, I think it depends on what kind of panel data. So if it's kind of this kind of different diff setting where each, so it's a panel data and each individual is getting treated at different Right at different times, if it's this kind of panel data setting, then it does not apply. And actually, I think it will be a very good re research direction to apply this kind of balancing to that kind of data set. However, yeah. if what you're talking about is a panel data, uh, I think I th if it's just simply question, some like fixed effects, then I think it's okay. But if it's a panel data set where mm -hmm. the treatment is going to vary, then strictly does not apply. But then I think that's yeah, that's absolutely, uh, you know, I think a, a, a really great research direction to look into. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. the question yeah. comes from, uh, because we have many question marks, like the treated or not treated, and at a certain point in time. And then if the, we, hypothetically, like I said, that we have uh, two or three years of, uh, of data when 2013, 14, and the 15, and then we all have the same, same um, measures. And does it help or? Uh, I think it depends on how you view, yeah, how you view the um, treatment, right? So, so um, I think it works so, when you have no turn limit in this case. <laughs> Yeah, as long no I think limit. as long as yeah. like like there's no dynamic effect in a sense that it's not like mm -hmm. you know individual one is treated in the first period and individual two is treated in the second period. As long as it's not this kind of scenario, I think will be fine because that is, is kind of the different diff setting. But but here, if you can pure, if you your concern is, I, I could just totally view the time period as a control variable and there's no dynamic effect. I think that could be okay so i think it depends on the specific panel data structure that you're yeah. trying to analyze think about, think but about i will be careful no there. So, yeah 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 okay. mm -hmm. yeah if no term limits and then that means uh, uh so that will not have such a, a, a strong temporal dependency because uh, the second term is always uh, like a a, 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 a a treatment it's a different type of treatment and uh, now you have no term limits and like a u.s Congressional elections, so there will be up to the individuals to to determine whether uh, he or she retires, right? So that will be something. Of course, that that will be a different uh, variable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, here you only have two terms. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Yeah. That will be really interesting. Really uh, apply to U.S. Now, I have I have uh, some remarks, maybe uh, some some thoughts, and uh, yeah. So we when we do the machine learning, and we. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is really interesting, and but when we do the machine learning, so we think about this and uh, uh, applying with uh, applying all these regularization methods. Yeah, yeah. The idea is to to reduce variance, and yeah, yeah. Uh, even though we suffer some bias, yeah, yeah. we we deal, we 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 just deal with it. And uh, but the idea the, the the point is to to focus on reduction of variance, and yeah, then. Yeah. Uh, Try different ways of cross, cross validation, so we can still uh, uh, similarly uh, achieve the result or get a better prediction. But of course, this one is to illustrate how we can do that uh, more like a, uh, explaining the effect of the very important treatment effect. And uh, so, machine learning uh, can can still do some. For example, no, absolutely, uh, like yes, identifying so the no, yeah. no, you, uh, no, yeah, I to, think to identify the, the most important so that's exactly effect, yeah. so. So here, if you try to achieve exact balancing, right? So that's it. Mm -hmm. That's it, that's similar to, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't apply any regularization. But actually, because I didn't have time to discuss, but yeah. 
the actually the method I'm promoting is the MSC optimal balancing. So in actually in this in this uh -huh. case, yeah. Yeah. you're not going to do exact balancing. So what you're going to do is going to, you know, balance the, best the you degree can do. of imbalance yeah. and the unstableness mm -hmm. of the balancing weight. So this is kind of essentially yes, a regularized yes. estimator. So this is going to say, well, yeah. there's no point mm -hmm. to achieve exact balancing because what you care is a mean square error. And the conclusion from yes. here, which I didn't have time yeah. to discuss, which is, right, if you care about the mean square error, then essentially what you're going to minimize is just this two term. Yes. This term controls yeah. the degree of imbalance. The other terms controls the mm -hmm. unstableness or which kind of of this balancing weight, you can view it as the variance effect, right? So that's exactly the machine learning part of it. So, so base, yeah. So once yeah, you understand balancing, error. it's very easy yeah. to get here. Just to say, you know, exact. Actually, balancing is good, but actually, you shouldn't balance exactly <laughs> because, you know, in the end, what you care is not whether it's balanced or not. What you care is whether yes. mean square error yeah. is small or not. So you have to yes. take this additional effect into account. So that I think, yeah, thanks for asking this question so that I could, yeah, promote this. <laughs> addressing the question of, of the, the, sorry, the, the, I, I did not see the slide. The slide. Yeah, no, no, it's very, my bad. Uh, address yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Great, great. More questions from US or Taiwan side, and uh, I think uh, uh, really, really interesting. Is it okay uh, you can pass the slides to us so I can distribute it on, on our website? No, absolutely. Yes, yes, I could. Yeah, I'll send yeah. you. Great, yeah. great. After, yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think that would be great because we missed a few uh, pages and at the last minutes of your talk. So yeah, it'd be great if we can share the the slides and then we. No, start. no, absolutely, that is no problem at all. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. could Thank be two you. talks, and uh, I think yeah, I mean, material is good enough for two talks. <laughs> <laughs> because I was a bit unsure, so I think yeah, about the audience. So, but I think yeah, but first, I think the, the key idea second, is yeah. like if as long as you understand matching. You could just uh, understand yeah, balancing yeah. as more flexible way of doing matching, and then it's very easy to go into what exact you know to this kind of approximate balancing or mean square error optimal balancing. So I think that's that's fine. Yeah, but but uh, yeah, I think it's great to talk yeah. here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Sorry, Carl, do you I, I have think any Peter, other do you questions? have more questions? Yeah, go ahead. USI, sir. Uh, I uh, I think side, uh, we do questions. not have any hands up or any questions on my side yet. Go ahead, please, if you have any from the Taiwan students, go ahead. Okay, um, I there is another. I'm not sure if this kind of minor though, because um, uh, no, please, yeah, yeah, Chen, can you just um, flip back to the maybe the first a couple of pages? You know, you you show the difference of the estimates uh, with different controls. Yeah. Yes. This. Here, or maybe here. Yeah. Um. That. I mean, the difference. Uh, just um, the difference or or the increased outcomes, right? It's like um, going upwards. Oh, you mean and this? Uh, this one. Yeah, that one. Because um, yeah. the, of course we can see it's clear that it's not proportional to the number of additional subset of controls, right? Yeah, it's not yeah, proportional. Yeah. So although the estimates are incorrect, uh, we we know that right now. So and and it, the R square of each subset of control, this still varies, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If for example, like the um, the political General. institutes, mm -hmm. and then you add four more uh, controls, and then the amount of increase is like uh, something. I, well. Yeah. So if you add more like controls you know r square is going to increase right because you explain more and more right so yeah right yeah. and then it's not it's not proportional either so uh any explanation of that uh or is simply random you add four well more, i think you add seven more or you add like eight more or 20 and then the the it still varies so well, how do you explain this variation on is yeah. that just so i think that's random? yeah i think that's a great question i think i think that's kind of i think related to what carl, uh, carl just asked i mean i think in the beginning of the talk because i think in order to really like let's say analyze how much is increase in r square and how much is increased for each of them not only mm -hmm. do you have to care about the correlation mm -hmm. between <laughs> treatment with this, you know, these characteristics and with the outcome. And also you have to analyze the correlation between all these uh, 
these characteristics, which would be very complicated, right? So it's not easy to 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 analyze, like exactly disentangle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, to disentangle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to disentangle exactly. You know, once you add more and more covariates, how this should you know evolve or how R square should look like? Because that you know too many correlations that is in play here. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. But I think the key message is like here is that you add here, you see this trend, but you you're not expecting to see it, and you know that confuses you, right? Because it's a natural experiment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. True. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think the time is about. <laughs> we have to wrap it up. Uh, Carl. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. I think it's it's very interesting. And uh, well, thank you for your questions. I enjoy uh, eye opening your questions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's really eye opening for us to get a take a new perspective about this uh, unbalanced uh, uh, um, uh, model. If we do not uh, take into this account and um, overestimate it or and 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 or uh, uh, some some mis pro uh, some mis uh, uh, missing estimation data, yeah. of that human effect. Yeah, and now I think that this is, this is something we we learn. And uh, are you making any, uh, creating any package or um, any procedures yeah. that uh, you, you do? Yeah, the that's what that happens. That but people, yeah, I'd, I'd love to, yeah, I'd love to. But the th yeah, um, I think I think the theory is there. The estimator is extremely simple, um, but I don't mm -hmm. have the particular technical skill to apply it. I would love to, <laughs> if I can find someone who could help me develop a park. Yeah. I mean, I have the code, but it's, yeah. it's different yeah. saying, Developing a data package or an R package, right? So mm -hmm. at yeah. this moment, mm -hmm. no. But yeah. I think the estimator is very simple. So uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So um, that will be on my agenda. Great. Yeah. It, it would be great. You will share your paper, uh, papers, and uh, so we can also uh, uh, disseminate this uh, slides and also that the papers with the, with the students, and we can learn more. And uh, Ideally, yeah, okay. we can uh, bring it back again in the future. <laughs> we can do more uh, illustration, maybe a workshop, and yeah, we we can we can we can uh, uh, think about this and maybe future workshop to learn learn about this balancing method, and uh, this will be particularly uh, useful when we do applications. And oh, okay, that'd be great. Uh, I think at this point, <laughs> yeah, 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 and uh, it will be our pleasure and honor to. And uh, at this point, I think Peter, I think we will. Uh, we are 10:05 now in uh, in, in US and 11:05 uh, in, in in New York, and um, oh, so yeah. do you have any uh, concluding remarks and uh, any uh, things that you want to remind uh, our students and our audience? Okay, um, I just want to say thank you, especially for today's guest speaker, uh, Dr. Yes. Xu. And also, uh, I have to just thank all the participants for supporting our colloquium for the past, Indeed. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it's about eight or nine weeks, right, uh, for this season. Yes. And uh, this is the season finale that has just said in the opening uh, remarks. Uh, so uh, please uh, continue to stay tuned and, and support us. Yes. I think we're mm -hmm. going to convene another set of international well-known scholars for the next season. So please uh, be expected, uh, expecting uh, our next, uh, well, next uh, next season of a webinar. And then I spe especially yes. I have to thank Dr. Carl Ho and for inviting all those, um, you know, very, very well-known scholars here. So uh, mm -hmm. I think we have gained some, uh, well, uh, I, at least from the Taiwan side, uh, we have a few <coughs> uh, participants from other schools, uh, like the Seneca or some uh, some other institutes. Uh, they are looking Great. forward yeah. to to yeah join our webinar. So I think that yeah I'm I'm looking for uh, the next season and yes. so uh, yeah. same here same here yeah so and um, anything you yeah, want to please stay tuned uh, again and yeah. Uh, make sure you check back our website, daacolloquium.com. We have uh, all this uh, video and also the materials and the slides will be posted on the same website and the videos are from YouTube. And uh, uh, yeah, and maybe in future we need to do some of the subscription system and uh, uh, keep you informed any developments and any, any uh, progress and all the new events and, uh, from the colloquium. And 
Dr. Pan is already organizing something in, ta in Taiwan, uh, like a certificate program. Hopefully, we can do more and uh, from this initiative, this colloquium. Yep. All right. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, I also want to thank the organizers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Xiu, again, and, um, and hope you stay warm and have a great <laughs> A uh, winter you break. Too. Yeah, and thank also you for say, having me. Stay in touch too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Stay in touch Bye. too. Okay. Well, hopefully, yeah. we can cross path in person in future. Yeah. <laughs> all Bye. right. Thank you all. Right. Bye. 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 Bye, Bye, Dr. Chu. Yeah, good day. Okay. Bye. I think I have to wrap this up and yeah. Then we, I think we we conclude the whole season and um, it's really great uh, studying and learning something together with you all and also the students from US, um, from Taiwan, and such a great experience and uh, working together with Dr. P Dr. Pan. And um, I really look forward to have more opportunities to to organizing something like events like, like this together and um, inviting more uh, renowned scholars and uh, more uh, uh, from uh, data scientists or from uh, social scientists from different disciplines and to learn from each other. All right, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hope to see you soon. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Yep. <laughs> okay, bye.